Well, my entire career has been in international development, and I've worked with a lot of leaders over the years. I've been involved with uh, G20 uh, finance ministers, and I've been involved with other figures such as Prince El Hassan of Jordan and uh, Tony Blair, and I was involved with Gordon Brown and also um, Nicolas Sarkozy. So these are all people who have helped to shape some of my views about what I think may be lying ahead in terms of the global political and economic situation. Individual ethic is actually competing against the whole. And the whole often suppresses the individual. So, so the, the epistemology has to go forward to recognize that in order to balance the individual and the collective, we can't have this political dialogue between uh, political left and political right, but whether the government should be more or less involved in the, um, in the market. That doesn't frame the issue. It doesn't show the fact that both the government and the market are exploiting the commons. So the commons is a, a much more embracing aspect of the epistemology. It's the only way we can, in my view, resolve the epistemological crisis that we're in by this left and right debate and because ultimately the political left and right ideology does come down to left and right uh, hemispheres in the human brain. And therefore, um, it, it does behoove us to, to give some quarter to the epistemology behind that. Given that, um, the, the commons is emerging as a really all-encompassing vision of what's possible to link um, ways of bringing uh, the state, the, the ideals of the state, which are largely equality and justice, and the ideals of the market, which is individual freedom. So again, the collective and the individual, bringing it down to the, to the local level, where people can reclaim that sense of equality and justice, on one hand, through their um, co-governance co of their resources, and the individual freedom through the co-production of their resources at, at local levels. This is what's missing, and it's missing in a lot of the debate um, that is emerging right now about how to uh, frame the commons as political accountability structures. And there are various ideas around this, but my sense is that once we've recognized, um, looking for those diagrams, yeah. uh, once we've recognized the, the necessity to emphasize the human mind and the fact that the mind represents the self, and, the, and our emphasis on nature and society are very objectified. And once we've been able to get that more uh, holistic recognition of self <coughs> into the mix, then I think we're able to recognize that there's also a kind of triarchical structure that we're talking about between trusts and governments and markets. And to, to break ourselves out of the dualism that is crippling us, epistemologically and also in terms of economic, social, political policy. So the commons is a bridging metaphor here, and actually it's more than a metaphor, it's actually a, a structural principle, because for the first time we're recognizing that you can, act, you can really do a, um, a, a, a vision of unity based on the fact that some resources are not replenishable, they're depletable resources, and the fact that some resources are replenishable. And how do you put those two things together? Because economics has never been able to figure that out. There's always been the appeal to externalities. The commons shows us that we can put them both together because the, the commons is not just the natural resources and the material resources as we normally think of commons, but it's, it's now beginning to break through with what we are calling social capital, and, uh, but it really social, society is a commons, culture is a commons, the ideas that we have are commons, intellectual property, that is, and um, uh, digital space is certainly a commons. Our genetics are commons. Uh, so what are we doing? We're, we're looking at these issues in, uh, as single issues, 
But they're really, I mean, NGOs have recognized for a long time that the interdisciplinary uh, uh, nature of the, of the issues uh, has to be recognized and they have to be brought together. But the Commons is a, a framework that is able to do that. So um, my appeal is to NGOs and to, to business and government to begin to recognize the open source models that are emerging from the uh, digital world as a, as a real driving metaphor for what's possible at the local levels and also the regional levels and really ultimately the, the, uh, the, gover the global level because, because here's the great disruptor, it seems to me, or, or one of them, in, in reckoning how we move forward. Um, the, the individual uh, stress uh, in Western liberalism has always been on uh, ownership and I think that the more collective or holistic vision now is, is moving towards stewardship and, and trusteeship of, of resources rather than ownership. That's one of the disruptors. But the other one that I think operationalizes that, and it's being driven by technology, it's being driven by our application of technology, but I think it's being driven by a larger force, which you could call evolutionary, which is that the resource users are becoming the producers of their own resources. And this model is breaking everything down, or at least it will eventually. But right now, the commoners have discovered that principle, and they're moving forward with it. So now, if we have the irreducible fact of economics that there are depletable resources and replenishable resources, now we have a, a way of, un of holding them together in a, in a broader framework, which recognizes that, um, that the only way that um, the economics of the past would work were through centralized decision-making structures, hierarchies, and now we have to go to a much more horizontal kind of decision-making, and that truly is what the, the commons is representing. And again, last point is that you see this popping up all over the place, not only with Occupy, but um, many NGOs are coming to the realization, it's, it seems to me right now, that the management of, and, and management and co-production of resources leads to that kind of missing piece that's always been in Western liberalism about how do you how do you get to the point of policies that have that ontology that engages people in the moment, that delivers services directly and immediately to people, and, and doesn't, we don't have to wait on time lags in the, in the marketplace, the business cycle. We don't have to wait on bureaucratic inertia and red tape. Now we can have uh, the, the re-expression um, of the ideals from uh, the market, which is individual freedom, we can have the ideals of, of the state, which is equity and, and social justice. We can actually express those at the local levels. And the commons seems to be the bridging formula that is making that possible. So uh, I, I, I'm going to talk five minutes about one potential um, thing that we spend a lot of time trying to figure out here, which is money. As uh, whether, and the overarching question of course today is for discussing how the concept of the commons as an organizing principle and so on, as well as an epistemology, might help us communicate and discuss and explore how to reform money. Um, I, and it's the less obvious one perhaps than, than Annual's presentation following about natural commons, because this is a social commons, I suppose you could say. Uh, now, I don't know how many of you, uh, well, I do know that some of you are uh, experts in the whole question of money, um, but, but for those that aren't, it might not be immediately obvious how you could describe money as a common. So I'll just briefly explain how it might be. And I'm not going to explore the morality of whether we need, should have money as a means of exchange and versus gift economies and generalised exchange or anything like that. This is assuming a modern economy that has money. Well, the key is this. Money has, um, as some of you will know, has, has several functions. One is a unit of account. One is as a store of value, the other is as a medium of exchange. Now, it, I'm going to talk about the, the function as a medium of exchange, something that facilitates us to exchange, because it is that aspect of money which I believe actually is a social commons. And so, uh, you know, if you go right back into history, as David Graeber, for example, did in his book, uh, debt the first 5,000 years, you discover that money uh, didn't arise spontaneously as gold or anything else that had intrinsic value from barter. It actually was a system of accounting, a system of uh, recording social relationships of credit and debt, a way of uh, somebody somewhere recording the fact that I'd produced 10 bushels of wheat and deposited them in the central you know, thing, and therefore I should be able to exchange it at some point in the future for an equivalent value. 
Okay, it's just a way of recording. So this here, which is a pound coin, for those of you who've not seen one before, uh, is, is just a token. It is a token. I mean, everybody knows that there's no gold in this. It's gold coloured, but it's clearly, it clearly has no intrinsic value whatsoever. It is a token. I can use it to buy things only because the state, which is only us collectively, says, agrees that we can, right? It is, it is a token. Um, and the money, and of course now it's, it's more, uh, I should be waving a phone at you because of course really most of it's on your bank balance in digital, it's digital tokens in your bank account. Our current system has privatised the creation of these tokens um, through a system that means that new money can only really be, well 97% of it at least, can only be... Uh, spent into the economy if, if somebody borrows it from a bank at interest. And we're sort of so used to, to that that um, it, it, uh, most people, I know some of the people in this room are very aware of it, but as a communication point, one of the things we try to do is explain that this is how money is actually created. But that's a very difficult conversation to have with conventional economists or the person on the street because it's quite esoteric, it's very abstract, it's quite hard to explain to them either that banks could really create money out of thin air, which they don't really want to believe, or that even that that should matter to them, or that that might be one of the reasons why we are exceeding our environmental limits, or that that be one, might be one of the reasons why we have severe inequality. These are all very, very hard concepts to explain. And so I'm quite interested in exploring the extent to which recasting this issue is very much a question in the Commons might be helpful. And just to sort of put th how important it is that, this, that these tokens, that you should have enough of them, in the right hands, you know. I mean, uh, there's a, a story about the Great Depression in the US in the 1930s that, that may be a sort of apocryphal story, but it, I'm sure it probably happened, uh, that you had a family sort of on the side of the road, homeless, with hungry children, whilst a few miles up the road, farmers pouring milk down the drains because there was no market for their milk. Now, I think James mentioned something about this earlier on. You know, a, 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 an abstract, socially constructed thing, money, has got between the milk and, and, and the hungry child. And that seems ridiculous. Well, it doesn't seem ridiculous, it is ridiculous. And you look at Greece today. Post-financial crisis, Greece has the same amount of sunlight falling it, on it, the same number of olive groves, groves, and the same number of fish in the sea, or what have you. The sort of people are just as creative as they were before, probably more now. <laughs> and so if all those resources are the same, why is it in such desperate trouble. Well, because the financial system has let it down, and fundamentally what it doesn't have is enough of these tokens to use as means of exchange. The economy is, uh, has broken down because of that. So, it's clearly a very important function, money as a means of exchange, and in order to get us from a system which breaks down in the way I've just described, those two examples, US in the 1930s, Greece today, to get away from a system where it's currently produced as money, um, as debt, interest bearing, I wonder whether it might be more helpful to try to introduce the idea of the Commons into the question of reforming money and finance, but um, that's the question which we're sort of looking to discuss mm -hmm. later on, so thank you very much. People don't think of fish as a public resource that they should benefit from. For too many years this has been given away as a gift to people to make money out of it without thinking what, what society can claim back from it. In some healthy fisheries, like in the United States, fishermen pay sometimes 80% of the value that they get from their fishery in terms of rents that are paid back to society. Europe is far from that because most of the stocks are still overexploited. But in the future, if we get to a sustainable management of the resources, there is a case to say all those benefits should go back to society in some form. But there is a big debate on um, reclaiming that ownership or that right for, from the people that have it now, because then they can challenge governments and take them to legal action. So there is a, a fear. I mean, I know that for sure that the UK government is scared of reclaiming that right from people that own it now. And there is this famous example of um, sleeper skippers, so people that don't fish anymore, that are just like making money out of the, of the right to fish by selling it and leasing it to other people. It's even claimed as a, I don't know, it's, it's been proved yet that, that Manchester United owns some fishing quota and they make money out of it, leasing it to others. So 
it raises some questions, and, and I think it's an interesting um, process now because we're seeing the privatization of a common resource um, as it happens, and the, the public in Europe, in the middle of a, I'm taking Europe as an example, in the middle of a huge economic crisis where public resources should be delivering for society, um, I think it creates a, a positive context to rethink so, how some of these solutions um, are, put in, are put in place. So it can be an interesting um, <coughs> example or illustration where the, the commons as a, as a theme can, can be used to do that. I'm just going to say one very brief thing about where um, NEF, New Economics Foundation, is overall in terms of its work to relate it to the Commons and then we'll open it up um, for debate. Um, the work here is, is run through particular programmes, um, uh, programme teams, um, two of their heads are here, so Aniel's work on environmental economics and Tony's work on uh, finance and business. But in addition to that, we're very aware um, a few years ago, as many people are in different organisations, that whilst we might be able to pick off particular victories in each of those areas, there is a bigger, there is a bigger battle to be had. And it was trying to get to grips, as many other organisations have, with what you do about that. How you can actually get transition within the frame in which those, those debates are had um, is a critical part of that. And we have what we refer to as the great transition as being part of what we're uh, collectively trying to achieve. Um, and we do work on, uh, we actually have a work developing a uh, systems dynamic economic model actually as one of the methods of us being able to analyse that but also we do work around campaigns and movement building around the idea of a great transition and in a way that's where this uh, debate around tables can be very helpful for us to be able to look at it to say what role can we work with the idea of the commons to be able to deliver that and I come back to those two questions that I was uh, uh, posing um, seeing as completely dominant conventional economic thinking in the media and in politics and everywhere is, is the neoliberal one that we face. Um, if the idea of the commons is, is a disruptor to that, as James was explaining why it was, where are the places that we can use it the best, most realistically? Where's the most realistic chance that we could actually do work on it, use it as a concept to be able to deliver that change? So where is it most effective as a disruptor? Um, right now and the second thing more broadly is whilst we can sit in a room and talk about the commons and many of us may know that idea or be able to come at it from different angles how do you convert that into being something that ordinary people um, voters people reading the media people responding on Facebook Twitter whatever else can actually get hold of it as an idea <coughs> and actually relate to it and say yeah that makes sense in the same way that the neoliberal project ended up with in the 1970s of developing those ideas of like free markets and personal choice and things that people just said, I want that as a basic idea, I can really relate to it. How do you convert the commons and what we do in the work we do to actually deliver that? So that becomes a sort of, yeah, that's right, I, I, I get that. How do we actually do that work? So it's very much in the realm of theoretical, in the practical about how we take things forward, be a really useful debate, <coughs> certainly for us here at, here at NEF. The question of money has a parallel debate at the international level because the international monetary system will break down in the next, mm -hmm. within the next years. And therefore, um, if, the, if we have something similar uh, imposed on the uh, world monetary system as we've had in the past, like a gold standard or a fiat currency with, you know, which with America as the dollar hegemon, which is in effect a, an oil standard. Um, it, it, providing value to global currency. If we have something like that in the future, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a, a real a real tragedy. And therefore, the, it seems to me that the debate that's happening about alternative currencies and barter at local levels is very, very important, but I think that debate's still in its infancy. And you're right to really differentiate the, the three aspects of money because we really need to get that clearly in, in frame because of the alternative currency movement is um, all over the board uh, in terms of how they how they issue uh, their money, and yet at the same time we want the maximum diversity, uh, if, but with local people deciding how that would go. But what, what I'm getting at is that we're the the two tracks at the international and the local levels are really going to converge at some point because 
because the model that, that I've been introducing to the G20 finance ministers uh, was at their meeting a, f a few weeks ago, uh, and it's one alternative model that they're looking at. And you know, I, I, I don't know why they're asking me to come to those meetings, but uh, they want to pick my brain, I think, of, of, on these issues. But it's because I've been talking about using the commons as a basket of reserve assets mm -hmm. that could give value to an international <laughs> standard of value to which each individual country could peg their own currency. So there wouldn't be a global currency, but it would be a standard mm -hmm. that we could use that would actually um, provide a, a, a monetary standard of value. And then at the local levels, people who don't want to use that can um, are, are totally free to, you know, to, to barter or to create a, a some sort of alternative exchange system. My sense is that the, the commons movement could really benefit from a, a political party that really addressed issues such as assets and wealth, because that's something that uh, tra that takes the commons from from the fringes right into the mainstream. Having having a, a, a clear policy uh, on um, you know how safe are my assets. And what about this degrowth movement? And what do you mean growth is, 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 uh, is, is bad? And in really addressing that in terms of a new kind of wealth that could be created, and also the fact of political accountability, because the commons movement is talking about creating these new political accountability structures at local levels, begin to talk about how um, we're, we're all dissatisfied with the, uh, the accountability of government as it, uh, as it uh, has been provisioning uh, goods and services. And also, the key one, I think, is job creation, because peer-to-peer -peer job creation is a real tangible possibility in the future, and I think that would excite voters very much. What do you mean job creation? Uh, I don't see any evidence of it, but yet, but yet when the resource users are becoming the producers of their own resources, if we had that other monetary system in place either you know, not maybe from the large sense, but in the in the local sense, then we can talk meaningfully about job creation in a, in a new way. I don't think a political party is ready to, to embrace that as, a, as a, a debate right now, but I do see that emerging in the next few years as a real issue. And the last uh, point uh, from a political platform would be conservation, because this is something that I think appeals to lots of people. I was thinking about this before we came in, and um, I, I dusted off a very old um, report that we did about 10 years ago, which we called The Limits to Property, The Failure of Restrictive Property Regimes in the Modern World. Um, we kind of dip back to Plato and Aristotle, and it made me think that um, this kind of grand struggle between the public sphere and the private sphere is as old as civilization itself, and the border... The struggle over the over the border between the two is is ever thus, and I and I think it's it, for me I find it kind of quite useful to think in terms of the fact that even when we talk about the commons, obviously this is not a monolithic entity. That there are multiple ways of managing common resources. Whether you talk about you know user rights or time limited rights or, or whatever, there's lots of different regimes that you can imagine for the intelligent management of common resources. Um, but thinking more about that, it, it came back uh, in answer to Tim's question. Um, two things came back to me. One is that in configuring a new kind of politics around a, a more um, inclusive and progressive management of common domains, that we can afford at the moment to be incredibly confident and we should be incredibly confident because we're standing in the midst of, of, of the rubble, of the, of the failure of the alternative, if you like. You know, the, the transparent and obvious and functional breakdown of market-based systems which uh, excessively privilege individual property rights within this. And when you trip through the issues, the way in which the, the right mounted an effective assault on the left, and I know we're talking about coming up with a new typology to discuss these sorts of issues, in the 70s and 80s by explicitly p talking about the loony left and, and what you know, the boroughs of Lambeth got up to, etc., etc., etc. The ways in which you can talk to things which speak to the common sense about the failure of existing property rights regimes, whether that's in terms of the extremes of homelessness on the one hand and 
800,000 properties standing empty in the United Kingdom on the other, whether that's through unaffordable drugs and surplus profits in pharmaceutical companies and the deaths of children um, around the world on the other, whether that's about transboundary pollution issues on climate change, whether it's around access to water and the failure of fee-based, marketised, privatised water systems, wherever you are in the world, whether it's about the internet, as you were saying, and people's instinctive sense now, this, this expectation that things should be there and should be shared and should be free, or whether it's about the, you know, the money system, as, as Tony was pointing out, and the fact that um, people didn't even realise that we gift to the banks the right to benefit, massively profit from the privilege of being able to kind of print their own money, which we then have to pay a, 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 lot, a lot for. So it strikes me that, that apart from anything else, that you can speak in examples which mean things to people, which connect with people, both emotively and intellectually. And there's a moment now where we can be incredibly confident and we should be shouting and ridiculing the failure of the property <laughs> regimes which have failed us so demonstrably at the moment. We should be really on the, sort of to use a cricketing analogy, on the front foot with this. Um, and, and I think as a, as a, as a potential suite of issues for political mobilisation, um, they absolutely speak to the pub debate, absolutely speak to being able to communicate to people in a language that everybody can understand without needing to draw down any technical, political, theorising language. Um, that was my tough and take me. There were two very interesting Victorians. Um, uh, one was called Octavia Hill uh, and one was called <coughs> Robert Hunter. Uh, together they came together to preserve the commons of London. We may be sat, we may be sat in on a former common here. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel their kind of spirit on my shoulder every day in a strange way um, because um, what they kind of um, stood for and tried to do uh, is, is still resonating today. Uh, and what they were trying to do was, was to keep something very tangible and very real and make it available to ordinary people like us. Uh, and that was an enormous struggle. And Robert Hunter fought for 10 years of his lifetime just to preserve one common, Epping Forest, mm. which was going to be chopped down and turned into an agricultural land. Uh, Paris is um, And he realised then that he couldn't do this every 10 years fight a battle for one common uh, <coughs> being lost. So he invented with Octavia Hill something called the National Trust, uh, which I think you know, most people may have heard of. Um, but the origins of the National Trust were purely in the battle to save commons. And they came up with a very interesting idea uh, in a paper that Robert Hunter wrote to a conference in 1884, which was about forming local land committees to create or preserve land around major conurbations and towns for the benefit of the people of those towns. So, um, bearing that in mind, I've taken it upon myself, in a way, to carry that spirit through. So I think we really do need a new commons movement in the same way that Robert Hunter and Octavia Hill set out a long time ago. Um, and I don't know whether we can do it, um, and I have to put my hand up here, I work for a state agency, uh, so I'm trying to convince the state that they should be doing this in a small way, but actually leading that kind of role uh, for the wider benefit of society. And in doing so, uh, I'm trying at this very moment in time to push the creation of new common lands and the creation of new common rights for everybody to do in whatever multiple land use way they can conceive of, uh, subject to you know, their circumstances. The availability of land, of course, is a big problem. Uh, there isn't a huge amount around here, but there are areas of green space which could be created as new commons in this very same way and stimulate for the everyman the interest that they have a stake in that so they become, in the popular political term, a genuine stakeholder. Even if it's just, as Octavia Hill invented the expression in the 1880s, to have a right of air and exercise. I'm fascinated by what I see an uh, emerging connection between what uh, Duncan is saying 
about the need for a new commons movement and what I heard Andrew saying about the political mobilization, <coughs> the pub debates, uh, and um, what I experienced since the beginning of this seminar series is uh, a very uplifting surprise that in spite uh, being in the business of commons education as a school of commoning, uh, we didn't know about a lot of commons that are happening and struggles uh, for the commons that are happening. Mm -hmm. So uh, convening <coughs> this seminar series gave us the possibility, the kind of attractor or visibility that people coming and telling about their, their work. And uh, th then I just, just realized that um, so there is definitely uh, not only a need but a possibility for what Jim was uh, calling uh, the commons as um, the political framework or what Tim was uh, telling at the very beginning of how to make uh, voters, um, how to tell the story so that it can become uh, an issue for, for the voters. What I see is one of the um, couple of things that is, that is needed, one is uh, well, uh, a full, one, one is definitely a, a close collaboration with uh, NEF and the School of Commoning because the main reason we, we created uh, the, this seminar series is to uh, bring the commons into the forefront of national discussion and we are a much uh, smaller organization than NEF so after this conversation it would be good to explore more in depth what can we do together and uh, another th thought that um, since um, we started paying, how, paying attention to how politicians relate uh, to the commons, well, we noticed that uh, Ed Miliband was talking about commons being the basis of good society. Uh, that's his version of uh, big society. But uh, of course, I, I would never argue with that commons is the basis of, of good society. But um, he is uh, speaking from a, a moral perspective and uh, what he thinks that uh, everybody would agree with it. And it's a good sign that he thinks that everybody, people would agree with it. But we need much more uh, than just a moral perspective that is needed, but we need the kind of uh, eco socio-economic uh, case uh, stories and prototypes and things that work and, and tell, tell the story. That so um, what I would add to it, that an interesting uh, bit uh, of information that when we published uh, a press release about this seminar series, the, uh, the only place from the political parties that picked it up, it was the Lib Dems. So uh, this, uh, this was published on some of the Lib Dem websites and <coughs> some Lib Dem people came to, to the seminar. So, uh, and, it, uh, and I think that the Commons should be an issue really beyond party politics. So um, developing the narrative that can uh, make it uh, mm -hmm. so that uh, it's not that the Commons needs the parties, it's the parties needs the Commons vote and for that I think that we need to develop the Commons movement as an autonomous uh, movement with clearly articulating its agenda, its policy requirement, and let the politicians uh, compete for the commons vote. I think the barriers to it are trying to find a language and an explanation that work as ever for us, as work as effectively as the language and the seductive nature of the, the politics of the right. I still think, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the commodification of, 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 of what's held in common, um, or what's held in public, you know, the personalization, the choice, the, the, the supposed efficiency, they still win. You know, even when, you know, reality's caught up with them and they've been exposed, they still kind of instinctively seem to win on that stuff. So I think we've got to challenge them, you know, on all of that, on all of that stuff. But, you know, the reality of the politics of markets that are too free and states that are too remote do open up, um, I think, a real space. But we, we'd have to work 
to get a language and a set of policies <coughs> to kind of pin people like Ed Miliband down. And um, Dan and I were at a meeting last week um, uh, discussing kind of this sort of stuff, and someone uh, said that, you know, the issue with all of this stuff about creating new spaces, spheres, commons, etc., is that people are going to have to be, have to occupy them, are going to have to spend time in them. And, and that means going to more meetings, right? I mean, you know, the <coughs> thing about socialism being, you know, to go to more meetings, yeah. And that's a problem, right? So this is all part of a kind of circular debate of, you know, finding the time, having a more seductive notion of what the good society and the good life is, and therefore cher cherishing these places, which are unique in terms of their ability to derive, you know, uh, uh, as, as the title says, common goods. So the first starting point is that all land has multiple usages and we're quite lucky that we're a large landowner so we have lots of different land that we can look at how we can use that. But there is a big challenge is that a lot of the land that we need for the commons is owned by other people. So there's a first, I suppose, a radical solution or a democratic solution to that, however you want to go about it. But, <laughs> so, but, um, but, but certainly within the land that we own we need to be much more savvy about how we can deliver multiple objectives and that might not just be allowing people to carry on shooting, it might be about access. It might be about energy, it might be about biomass, or other areas that we can do. So we've kind of looked at it and thought, most recently out of back of planning, is how can we use systems like neighbourhood planning, almost as a radical localism, I'm still not using the word radical, but, it kind of <laughs> <laughs> but as a kind of practical localism of how you can use that as a disruptive model. Um, and then starting off with the kind of land capability tool by looking at how you can do that. We're calling the whole process spirit of place. So we look back to the heritage of what people value, what they love, the so kind of the deep NIMBY stuff that people like to kind of see us for, mm -hmm. what your value, and then look to the future about what I want to achieve with a place, and then look at how you can use neighbourhood planning in what we would see as traditional community organising, going in there, talking to people what you've got. Now the next trick is where we probably need to find resource, and this is where people like Co-op have been really helpful, is that how can you then bring in consultants or finance to help do that? So in terms of radical localism, say why should large energy companies run our assets, whether that might be wind and planning permission locally or other things, but actually that should be community owned and it shouldn't be about community benefit either. Putting a new scout hut up because you're making millions of pounds off the moors around your home is not right, it should be about community ownership. And I think with the right resources coming in, so we've been doing it on energy, um, the most recent one I saw last week was an area of space where we had some old ancient apple trees, we just turned a new allotment, but in that we built a community festival into that village. So we put, looked at cultural commons as well. Um, so let's look at those very practical, and I think Duncan's got a whole list of, in an essay, it's probably worth sending around, of different areas which could be re-commons, and this is the new commons, but by piecing those together and then looking at a more holistic approach, which maybe neighbourhood planning or something could provide, with good financing and good consultancy to build those community renewables, sort of sizeable, you know, we're talking about big pieces of kit, whether it's community hydro or something, it's not necessarily just a small wind turbine on the side of a scout hut, it's, this is big kit. Um, and then good community organising about how you have that conversation in a way that's not pushing a radical political agenda maybe, it's just empowering people to look at what they've got, what skills they've got, putting finance and resources with that and start delivering these. And the more we can deliver and join up, before you know it, we can start recommoning areas. And I, and I do think it's that simple and the case studies are out there, but like climate change and energy efficiency, if you bolt them enough together, we've got all the solutions to stop climate change, it's just we haven't put them in one place. I think the Commons is a similar story, but I think we need to get away from looking at some utilitarian Techniques actually, it's cultural, it's heritage, it's, it's, it's much wider. It's, you know, it's just some of the stuff that Anthony Crossland had talked about, about making it artistic and interesting. And, you know, so that's kind of where we're coming from the trust, but it'd be good to hear practical and people have other ideas what people are doing out there. Uh, in Sweden, which was thought of as being an ideal place, we have this huge problem with the uh, densification it's called. It's the latest trend among planners and it's in the name of the environment. They say that if we have dense cities that will save energy on people being moved around. So the last vestiges of parks and things in, in Swedish cities are being built on by people making a lot of money from doing so in the name of the environment. So we have to, uh, fighting the ongoing enclosure is another way I think of engaging people which works. Say that you know currently we have a uh, a major financial crisis and which is affecting people in their everyday lives in terms of how they view the system etc. 
and uh, we have a bit of a political crisis as well, as we're seeing uh, uh, through different countries. So I wonder whether the t whether I could ask whether people had some thoughts on two things that are coming out. One of them is actually to go back to what Tony was saying about money, and given that that is at the root that that issue about how we've got ourselves into a situation where debt has become that such a large issue and we are driven by decisions made by people who are very, very remote to the reality of, of uh, ordinary people. And whether there's something there that, rather theoretically, actually there's something to be said about the Commons that actually cuts it in terms of being able to politically and, and media-wise, I don't know. Um, and the other one, sorry to mix them up together, but um, there's been quite a few things said around the idea of uh, democracy, actually, from uh, Magna Carta. Uh, through to the stuff about land committees or whatever else, or indeed Neil's thing about people having to find more time to go to bloody meetings left, right and centre. Um, but that idea of engaging people that they're more than just a voter or a consumer, but they are actually about more than that, is there, is, mm. is, is there something to make that sound attractive or politically poignant, or is that really just a sort of, uh, again, is that just a theoretical thing that uh, um, can be put aside? with a lot of real life individuals who are called commoners legally. Um, what, what they really uh, impressed upon me was um, this amazing duality of control. Uh, the commoners on one side taking what was called, the, and it's a French term, uh, the profit of the soil, as it was called, i.e. grass that their cattle could graze and then they could take things from their cattle or they could take fallen boughs that fell on the ground, they could use them in their houses um, in the way we would use plastics today. Um, what it taught me was that the, the balance of power was very circulatory and nobody, even though we inherited again from the Northern French connections, the, the concept of the land being owned by somebody but other people having rights over it, mm. that balance in exercise became very technical and it also became a, a foundation of small democracies everywhere mm. because you could always debate not not just about I mean Harding's tragedy uh, about resource depletion if your soil failed to produce the grass that your cattle ate but also the relationships <coughs> between people in the control of that vital common resource land itself or, or in the case of marine the seas and the products of the seas um, and it and it became a debating chamber from which a lot of very democratic principles emerged because people were genuinely stakeholders empowered to say, I have a right to say what I want to say, you can't take these things away from me. So it became a really, really powerful sense and every individual conveyed that power in the way they spoke about their common rights, in the way that we could speak about our common rights, but we don't. Mm -hmm. We're not empowered to do that. Mm -hmm. no, that's yes. why I think, think it's very important to actually get that point over, that we're as empowered as anybody else to talk about the things that are common to all of us, the air we breathe or whatever. Mm -hmm. We need to find that metaphor and make it stick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. From the people I talk to in finance and in banking, um, they've picked up that the commons is a buzzword and it's it, that um, they are trying to co-opt it just <coughs> as they've talked about sustainable money or mm -hmm. sustainable finance and and kind of water down the word till it's meaningless uh, they have that hasn't happened yet but I mean it's not meaningless yet but it, but I see them dabbling around the edges of it um, the Pentagon is talking about full spectrum dominance of the United States in terms of commons uh, outer space, uh, uh, the oceans, uh, land masses, uh, that sort of thing, and they're they're calling it commons. That the, com the global commons have to be coordinated and managed for the benefit of humanity in the future. And they're picking up a lot of the language of the commons movement, which gets back to the whole reason why we're here. That we we've really got to bring this forward um, quickly, mm -hmm. uh, and we're we are ahead of the curve because we've done more research mm -hmm. than they have because they're just dabbling in using commons as a metaphor. We're using it as a really structural principle, mm -hmm. and we have the, the power of making it a very salient political issue. Now, the, the point about finance and, and economics at this point is, 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 is everything, really, because mm -hmm. it is a power struggle over, over the money system, and it's a power uh, struggle that, um, that finance is, is exceedingly aware of. 
But I think finance uh, can be ultimately on our side because finance is also struggling with the same problems we're struggling with, which is a very unstable monetary system. So finance isn't a natural partner with, the, with monetary people or bankers. They're actually, in many cases, adversaries, or the, there's an adversarial relationship there in, uh, oftentimes. The financiers I've talked to really are interested in finding ways of financing um, trusteeships. And n not all of them, but there's enough, um, you know, 10% of the people in the finance world that I've talked to have that inclination that they would want to turn to financing these kind of the new structures that are coming forward. <coughs> However, the commons would be managed. But there's the larger question of, um, as I'd said earlier, the, um, how the international monetary system is going to find a new asset base for the future. And what I think a lot of people in the central banks are realizing is that um, they could probably uh, extend neoliberalism well into the future by creating uh, regional monetary structures like um, like the uh, European Union or the North American Union or Mercosur, which would create, which would reduce uh, the ecological footprint through greater market efficiency, might save us in the midst of a uh, monetary crash. Um, and but what does it give us? It gives us the same structure as we have now: hyper competitive now between states. Now in, in the future, hyper competitive between. Uh, regions that have the same, that share the same monetary structure, and obviously the lessons of the European Union now are, are showing us that you can't rush ahead and create a, a, a European un, uh, a monetary union without having a political buy-in, particularly from people. The issue now then is that what are the assets going to be to underpin a new value system in the in the future, and that's why I. I introduced this with epistemology in the first place because that's where it all starts. It's it's the resources, but it's people. Uh, value doesn't come from people themselves, just by people themselves. Doesn't mm. come from the, from the resources themselves. It's it's both plus the relationship between the people and the resources, and that's what's been missing uh, uh, largely in 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 the debate. And this is what the, the commons people really can bring forward. People have been talking about metaphors and symbols. I think there are practice symbols where you actually do it, and one of them is, for example, the Rambler movement or so on, which and I think that. Uh, the mass trespasses, but also the national park movement on, and these other things that uh, enabled pe working people to go into nature and walk together and do things together. I think that was part and parcel also of the labor movement. It gave it some kind of concrete grounding. Uh, and, but also for cooperative movements and uh, banking, the savings and loans, uh, cooperative shops. And these are commons that have recently been stolen from us, I think, basically, by new liberalism. All of a sudden, they were gone. Uh, and I think that it also it makes for an interesting principle when you're talking about politics in that the, the, the old-fashioned estates that Duncan was talking about where the, someone may have owned the estate but the commoners had rights in it. Uh, basically, the state, you could say, might own a park or something, but people have rights in it. And, and the problem with, say, communism was that the state owned everything and nobody had any rights in it. And that was, that was where it went wrong. And I, so I think that that's an interesting principle there. I think that, well, Eleanor Ostrom and the, who's a wonderful person and, and the economic approach that people have been talking about is important. Uh, it is also the dismal <coughs> science, you might say. Maybe I shouldn't say that here. But uh, feel free. <laughs> it's, it's problematically abstract for ordinary people. So it's important to have these higher principles, but something that people can actually do, like hike together, do things, yeah. makes the difference, I think. Yeah. That's a very good Point. Yeah, the commons is learning by doing, and in that sense, yeah. uh, what I think happens in this talk, uh, we've we've really kind of focused on the governance aspects, and we've lost the production aspects. And the, if, if the commons has to be in balance between the governance and the production, <coughs> it's not only labor. It's now you know what's driving um, a new kind of commoning ethic is the recognition of this co-production that is possible, and it's not just sort of a uh, public-private partnership kind of thing, which actually has been co-opted by the neoliberal framework, but it's it's the the, the idea that uh, people you know become the, uh, the consumers of their own production, and that's the exciting thing that always has to be right at the center, not just the decision making, but the the, the actual production. And I think you know 
Marx is credited for anything. I think bringing that point forward and keeping it front and center is, is important. Cool. Uh, Duncan, then James. Just a quick hit. Um, because if, if anybody studied the language of commoners committees, I know the National Trust has quite a few and some of them are a bit problematical. Uh, they're very awkward people because they have the rights to be awkward, uh, long live the right to be awkward. Um, but they, the language of these committees is about profit of prawned, it's, it's about the profit of the soil. So it, it's very analogous to what you were saying about the language of banking systems. And of course, if your profit doesn't come up in the form of, say, grass, something as humble as grass, you don't put as many cows on it that year. You then monitor how it performs through that year. And if it's a dry year, the grass doesn't grow. So you're constantly monitoring and maintaining. And you do need law, because somebody needs to come along and say, oi, you can't put 10 cows on there this year because the grass isn't growing. So there is all this monitoring and all this regulation and all this control that goes into that humble system based on something as simple as grass growing out of the ground. Now, if you can transform that and the language of those commoners committees into any international financial system, A, good luck, but B, it would give you a lot of education in how those things work in small realities.